far from over the last U.S. troops leave Iraq, but questions remain over the country's future. Are Iraqi security forces ready to deal with a country ravaged by war and sectarian strife? And what are the challenges ahead? This is Inside Story. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Divya Gopalan. So the U.S. flag is lowered in Baghdad, formally marking the end of U.S. military operations in Iraq after nearly nine years. The last American troops are expected to leave the country within days by December 31st. U.S. troops peaked at around 170,000 during the so-called surge strategy in 2007. But as of this week, only about 5,500 remain. Many of them have already left for bases in Kuwait prior to flying home. The last combat troops departed Iraq in August of last year. However, a small contingent of some 200 soldiers will remain in Iraq as advisors, while some 15,000 U.S. personnel are now based at the American embassy in Baghdad, which is by far the world's largest. Well, whatever the reasons for going to war there, the overall result was perhaps not what America had bargained for. Countless civilian deaths and a long insurgency. Our correspondent Patty Culhane has been looking back at the promises and the predictions that were made nine years ago. If war is forced upon us... We to Americans, the war in Iraq was made to seem all but inevitable. This nation fights reluctantly because we know the cost. But what did Americans know? Our sources tell us that as U.S. military involvement ends, it's important to remember the how and why it began. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not assertions. These are facts corroborated by many sources. Those indisputable facts were not. The weapons of mass destruction were never found. We've learned that Iraq has trained al-Qaeda members in bomb making. Certainly by the time of the invasion, it was a very clear analytical conclusion within the U.S. government that there really had been no operational link between al-Qaeda and the Saddam regime. Americans were assured it would be a relatively easy and fast fight. My belief is we will, in fact, be greeted as liberators. For a time, that seemed possible. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. But then... There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. Now you go to war with the army you have, no, no. not the army you might want. Now why do we have to dig through local landfills for pieces of scrap metal? I'm the decider, and I decide what is best. But at the beginning, almost nine years ago, with embedded media and catchphrases. This is shock and awe, Tom. For many Americans, the war began with a made-for-TV, almost antiseptic feel. The real tragedy here is that the story of the Iraqi people and the suffering that they have gone through is still relatively um, poorly understood by Americans. Reset! American casualties were counted but their returning caskets were hidden from view for most of the war. Still, their family's grief was often broadcast. 4,483 American troops were killed. 32,200 seriously wounded on the battlefield. Americans were told the war wouldn't really be expensive. Oil revenues would pay for reconstruction. That didn't happen. The U.S. government is putting the figure for combat at around 800 billion. But Professor Kathy Lutz added up all the hidden expenses, long-term veterans benefits, interest on the debt, the cost of replacing equipment. At least three and a half trillion um, can be accounted for by the war in Iraq. That bill hasn't been paid. The money was borrowed while American taxes were cut. So after almost nine years, while many in the military have paid for war and likely will continue to, the country on the whole still has not. So in that sense, regardless of how it began, 
the burden of war will not end with a simple closing ceremony. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. With the security now in the hands of the Iraqi authorities, some Iraqis are concerned about the consequences of being left to manage their own security. Republicans have also criticized the pullout, citing fears over Iraq's stability. But President Obama, who came to office pledging to bring troops home, has stressed that the U.S. has left behind a, quote, stable Iraq. It's not a perfect place. It has many challenges ahead. But we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. After U.S. troops pull out of Iraq, a task to be completed by December 31st, what are the challenges ahead? Well, to discuss this, we're joined from Baghdad by the Iraqi Foreign Minister, Hoshiar Zabari. Mr. Zabari, firstly, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time with us. You're I welcome. want to start off with the U U.S. perspective. Barack Obama has said that he is leaving, or the U.S. is leaving behind, a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. Now, with what we've seen with the daily bombings and the shootings, and the fact that in November alone, 187 Iraqis were killed in violence, do you think this really is a correct statement or it's more of a quick getaway on an election promise for Barack Obama? No, I think the situation in Iraq has uh, improved a great deal. And indeed, Iraq is a sovereign country and it can uh, be self-reliant. Yes, there has, there has been a certain level of violence. The, we see this kind of violence in many Arab uh, cities and capitals these days. But... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we are entering a new phase, and uh, one of the key challenges for the Iraqi government is to address the security of the people of the country. And we believe we have uh, the forces, uh, the trained forces, that will be able to manage that, uh, especially for maintaining internal security. Still, there would be challenges to rebuild uh, the full scale of the Iraqi military and security forces in other areas of air defense, of uh, aircrafts, uh, naval forces. But uh, I think uh, Iraq uh, definitely is, is a sovereign and uh, it's a master of its destiny. Good. I want to talk about some of the challenges. And one of the biggest challenges is the government itself and what exists as a government. Now, um, I'm going to start off with some of uh, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's comments saying that uh, the withdrawal indicates success and it says that it is not a negative thing. But if you look at what's been left behind in Iraq compared to what was during Saddam Hussein's reign, regardless, you're looking at people, about 7 million Iraqis now living in poverty, 1.3 million people internally di displaced. Is the government in a place to deal with that right now? Yeah. A great deal belonged to the legacy of Saddam Hussein, whom you refer to, in fact. He was uh, responsible for this poverty. He was responsible for the degradations of the infrastructure, of the basic services. Yes, the new government also has its share of responsibilities, definitely. But uh, in fact, uh, we have security challenges, we have uh, political challenges, as you mentioned, but the government is an elected government. Uh, it expressed the will of the majority of the Iraqi people. It is an inclusive government, is a pluralistic government. These are the things that uh, m many people in many Arab countries are calling for. So. Uh, the, the key task for the government uh, is really to maintain the national political consensus that established the new regime in Iraq. Uh, this would be another key task for the Iraqi leaders. But you have to admit that uh, conditions are far worse now than they were uh, 10 years ago, say. For instance, in 2000, about 17 percent of Iraqis are said to be living in slum conditions. Now, 50% of Iraqis live in conditions that are unacceptable. Iraq is, not, is, is worse off than it was 10 years ago. No, I think there are other figures that can tell you it's better off in terms of freedoms, in terms of, of travels, in terms of access to information technology, in terms of uh, political representations. 
uh, even in services, in certain areas of services, but there has been uh, down trends also in many areas you mentioned the displacement of people caused by the wave of terrorism, by the, by the sectarian conflict that, uh, that was erupted uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, but the government has plans, in fact, to address this with the help and assistance of the United Nations, of uh, the international community, and the resources that Iraq has. I think it can build a better future for its people. I want to look at what it's taken to get to this point, the cost of the war on Iraq. Now, here are some figures. The U.S. government spent about $1 trillion to date on Iraq. Money aside, even more distressing is the human cost of the war. Now, coalition casualties, if you start with those, are numbered some 4,805 troops killed. Among those were 4,500 U.S. soldiers. But dwarfing that figure are the Iraqi casualties. Some estimates put that figure at around 100,000. Now, the conflict is also said to have displaced uh, 1.75 million people. Now, to bring up one of the U.S. Defense Secretary's qu qu quotes, Leon Panetta says, it was worth the price in blood and money as it has set the country on a path to democracy. How do you react to that? I agree. It was worth it. Uh, both in terms of uh, the sacrifices that we, the Iraqis, have paid to regain our freedom uh, and independence, and for all those uh, who help us, especially the American, the uh, successive Ira uh, American administrations, in fact, have been uh, very, very helpful and generous uh, to help and make Iraq a success uh, in the region. And we are seeing some of the benefit these days, but still there is a long way to go. Now, uh, the Iraqi government is questionable at the moment. There, there are certain issues. For instance, Maliki's, uh, Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister's cabinet, is still incomplete. He currently holds the portfolio for, uh, for security, defense. Some of the key portfolios are still in its hands. It hasn't been distributed. Is that not a concern for security looking forward? No, I think, yes, there are some vacant portfolio. I agree with you. But the government is working, is functioning. There are certain institutions in the Ministry of Defense or Interior. Yes, definitely it would have been much better, you see, to fill uh, these uh, portfolios. But the government is working. And uh, we have a democratic uh, system where uh, portfolios are being debated and discussed, and this has taken much longer. But uh, I think uh, this position would be filled uh, soon. Mr. Zabari, on the streets of Baghdad, there are some concerns. Now, what we did is we went and spoke to some Iraqis to see what they think about the American military's departure. And here's what some of them had to say. It's a joy for all Iraqis, not just for me. The U.S. withdrawal is something very big for us because the country's security will be in the hands of our brothers at the police and the army. They're from us. I'm very happy because the occupier is leaving the nation. The country will be ruled by its sons who will maintain it and keep its sovereignty. I'm happy and scared. I don't want to tell you. What scares me is terrorism. What can I say? God is generous. The Iraqi army and the Americans are here, and the terrorists are hurting us and kidnapping our husbands. Each time we say there will be change, but no, every day is worse than the other. So, as you can see there, mostly people are positive about the U.S. leaving, but there are some very, very deep concerns. And, and going back to the government, one of the con concerns is the efficacy of the government and how they operate. Now, looking from the inside, everyone knows there is a great, there are a great deal of issues. Looking from the outside, what's apparent is a lot of the corruption and lack of method to this government. In fact, Transparency International has, has them as one of the most corrupt governments there is. Are you not concerned that this government will not be able to come together for what this country needs? I think, my friend, you are making political statement. You see, more than uh, discussing certain issues, uh, there is corruption. There is corruption in many other countries. But there are ways also to fight this corruption. There is an independent commission uh, to fight corruption. There are many other layers, let's say, 
uh, to beat corruption, and it is an ongoing process. Uh, but uh, the Iraqi generally, in fact, the majority are happy because uh, uh, we, ha we as a government have implemented, have delivered on our pledge to implement the agreement of the withdrawal of forces on time. And there has been no uh, extensions or any delays. And both sides, the Iraqi government, the American uh, government, have lived up to their promises. OK. Um, the US is leaving. Boots on the ground are leaving. But what is apparent is the fact that the U.S. is leaving a huge presence behind, and mainly in this embassy. It's the biggest U.S. embassy in the world. You're seeing some 15,000 personnel, and you're also getting uh, security uh, advisors still there. Is the U.S. still going to be a big part of the direction which uh, Iraq takes from now on? Well, this is a sign. The size of the embassy is a sign of American uh, interest in this country. I mean, the American forces have withdrawn, but doesn't mean that American presence uh, will diminish. In fact, these uh, relations will continue. And these figures whom you refer to as highly exager exaggerated, in fact. Yes, it is a large embassy. It's one of the largest embassy. But uh, in fact, they are sub subject to international conventions. The, the, the remaining trainers would be subject to Iraqi laws. So there is no harm in that. OK, so given the US presence there, are you still going to be looking to the US for aid or advice or assistance? Yes, of course. We have a, a long-term strategic framework agreement that it doesn't have any time ceiling, uh, which will be the guideline for Iraq-U.S. Uh, relations in the future. And it covers all areas, uh, economic, com commerce, trade, uh, cultural, uh, energy, security, and so on. So that's why really many countries invade Iraq for securing such a long-term agreement. So given the lack of reinforcement and security now, how likely or how concerned are you that you will see that the Arab Spring spread to Iraq? No, I think uh, Iraq, uh, the, the toppling of Saddam Hussein was the beginning of the Arab Spring. And Iraq uh, present a model and example. And the Iraqi people have achieved each and every goal that the Arab people are calling for, for elections, for freedom, for empowerment, uh, for dignity for uh, a peaceful transfer of power and so on. So in fact, uh, we have supported the Arab Spring Revolution from Tunis to Yemen to Syria to Bahrain, wherever the, the, there are. And uh, therefore, uh, Iraq is not worried at all. In fact, Iraq has, has been in the leading position uh, for many years. Many people try to, to to delay Iraqi march and so on, but they failed, and the people of Iraq succeeded. And on a final note, would you say that Iraq is prepared now for the new dawn, for this new year that's coming ahead without American presence or military presence? Well, definitely Iraq Iraq is, is definitely is ready, is prepared uh, as an independent, sovereign, self-reliant country, as you started in the beginning of your interview. And the Iraqi people have shown a great deal of maturity. Uh, and yes, in fact, I believe the country is ready. Hoshir Zabari, Iraqi Foreign Minister, thank you so much for your time. Well, that's it for this edition of Inside Story. And to our viewers, if you want to send us your feedback, you can just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.